Nick uh, Ograve Ram and Antoine Zhu have come up with a much better algorithm. Amazing, brings the time down to two to the point three n roughly, and keeps the space about the same. So we're yes, very nice. And we're we're seeing uh, so breakthroughs in some of these fundamental algorithms for problems that have been key cryptographic problems for a long time. Um, the one project I've been involved with was one that mentioned earlier. David Chaum uh, led a team of people, uh, of whom I was one, on the Scantegrity uh, voting system in Tacoma Park. Uh, that was really a historic election, really bringing sophisticated cryptographic techniques to bear on, on uh, just a, a regular election for city council members and mayor. Uh, and the voters seemed to, to like it, so we're able to take this technology and make it usable as well as secure, which is, that's the challenge with, with some of the voting work is to, is to make it uh, meet not only the security requirements, but the usability requirements that, that we need to have, because everybody needs to vote. Um, moving on, uh, another seed was planted in 1991 when we published the list of RSA challenge numbers. Uh, so that was a list of, of numbers starting off with a 100-digit number, which was uh, broken fairly quickly, and then there was the 129-digit number that uh, was published in Scientific American that was broken a few years later. And this year, as, as Ari said, we've seen a, a breakthrough again with, with a team of Ari and Lenstra and Peter Montgomery and about a dozen other folks breaking RSA 768. That's 768 bits, not 768 digits, uh, and, and it's, a, it's a major accomplishment. They started about five years ago developing polynomials for the sieving process and spent several years of, of computer time doing this, so it's been broken. The implications for RSA 20, 1024 are that you know, 1024 may get broken in the next decade, and people should start thinking about moving to RSA 248 or other schemes uh, over the next few years. Um, and the final uh, one that I, I've been involved in is, is uh, had its seeds planted again in 1991 when MD5 was published. Uh, I've been involved in hash functions uh, since about then, and MD4 as well. Uh, I still could actually get calls about people saying, I would like to use MD5 in an application. And I, I think I sound a bit like Monty Python in the parrot skit when I, when I talk to these people. I say, MD5, that's a dead hash function. This hash function is extinct. It is no longer a hash function. <laughs> and, 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 uh, but uh, people keep wanting to use it. Um, NIST has gone on to uh, take in, into account the, uh, the breakthroughs that Xiaoyan Wang and others have done with hash functions and, and, and to uh, have a competition saying we need to, to improve our technology base for, for, for hash functions. Uh, MD6 was submitted, our team at MIT submitted that. Uh, the competition was all over the world, a lot of good submissions. We, one of the interesting events this year is we withdrew MD6 from the competition for the next round. We uh, saw that a lot of the algorithms were much faster than ours, and uh, we felt it was very important to have a proof of security against differential cryptanalysis. Uh, in order to reduce the number of rounds to be competitive speed-wise, our proof wouldn't work. So we withdrew it, and there's a lot of good entries left. I'm sure we'll see a great result from the, the SHA-3 competition. So those are the things I came prepared to remark about. I just wanted to say also that I, I liked um, Scott Charney's uh, introduction of the U-proof technology. It's nice to see so sophisticated cryptographic technology come into play for identity management and the ability to show um, credentials without having to show your identity in complete form is very nice, and I hope that gets uh, well-received. That's the end of my remarks. So each year I'm trying to uh, write uh, myself a list of the most uh, noteworthy cryptanalytic attacks. And uh, I must tell you that uh, this year uh, was one of the best I've seen. Uh, there were lots and lots of uh, interesting developments, ranging all the way from the most practical attacks uh, to very theoretical ones. So as an example of a major practical attack, uh, a couple of months ago, a group headed by Ross Anderson in the UK uh, published an amazingly simple attack on the uh, chip and pin system, which is used to uh, protect uh, the credit card uh, in the UK. So it turns out that in order to make the credit card system more secure, you put uh, a chip on uh, the card, and then when you want to buy something in the store, you uh, insert the card, into a small device, and you punch the password uh, into that uh, device, and the password is checked uh, on the uh, chip, uh, which is in your own card, not in the uh, back-end system. So the specification for this EMV uh, chip and pin uh, system uh, runs for about 700 pages. It tries to cover every possible aspect of security. Now, what Ross Anderson and his team discovered is that the way the chip reports back 
that the password was correct is to send back the message 9000, always. So it doesn't matter what is uh, the amount uh, being paid, the date, uh, any other details. The chip says, I am happy with the password by sending 9000. So all you have to do is to uh, just replace the chip and pin card by one which will always report 9000, and then you are done. It's a great attack. <clears throat> now, moving to more theoretical uh, kinds of attacks, the, this year was uh, really bountiful. Uh, we can uh, uh, look, for example, at uh, the state of the art with AES security. Uh, AES had been uh, looked for many, many years, and uh, this year, for the first time at uh, AsiaCrypt uh, 2009, uh, there was a paper published by uh, two Russian-born cryptanalysts uh, um, showing that it is possible to break uh, AES with uh, 256 bits and 192 uh, bit keys faster than exhaustive search. A major theoretical uh, improvement. And uh, then at uh, Eurocrypt 2010, there's going to be a paper by those uh, two guys and by three Israeli researchers uh, who, uh, where we are going to, uh, um, to describe an attack uh, which can break uh, AES uh, 128 with its 10 rounds. If you try to make it more secure by replacing the 128 bits by 256-bit key, then we can actually break the crypto system in about 2 to the 45, which is completely practical. <coughs> so uh, AES, the, this kind of hybrid, which has 10 rounds of AES-128, but where you try to make its key longer, uh, can be broken uh, with practical complexity. And finally, I'll just mention the, uh, um, an attack which was published about a month ago, uh, breaking the security of the soon-to-be-deployed A53. You all know the sad story of uh, A51 and A52, which were probably designed to be breakable by some people. And <laughs> <laughs> then uh, when A53 when A53 was designed, they decided to take a great crypto system uh, uh, designed by uh, uh, Dr. Matsui from Japan, and they tried to improve it. They took uh, Misty and improved it into Kasumi, and uh, it turns out that you can break the full Kasumi crypto system in about 2 to the 32 time. That's it. First, to require a disclaimer. I speak today as a private citizen. I will have comments to make, but they are mine alone and cannot be attributed and should not assume that the NSA endorses them. It's not that they are against them, they just haven't played in them, so they're mine alone. All right, I found several interesting things this year, and I may respond to some of those as well. Forgive the vision. Some of this is detailed. I'd like to congratulate the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, NTNU. They have a quantum hacking group, and many of you may know they broke a quantum cryptographic device by eavesdropping, catching 100% of the bits perfect, and neither endpoint knew it. A completely, total, catastrophic demonstration. And does this say the proof is wrong? No, the proof of perfect security was in physics. The physics is fine. They went after the implementation. It was a brutal but compelling demonstration of the need for quality in implementation. Please, vendors in the audience, listen to that. There are three papers I read that I thought were very interesting. I do not read broadly, so these aren't the best. I don't, they just tweaked me. I thought they were fun. Andrew Odlitsko, known to many of you, wrote a paper providing security within secure systems. There's an extended extract on his web page. He's giving it as a keynote speech of the YSEC conference coming up this month. But it is a good twist, a short synopsis. A mix of imperfect technical security measures and imperfect human processes may synergistically provide good enough security. And by the way, Bob Blakely of the Burton Group sings a similar song. But there are ways out of the mess we find ourselves in today of not having enough good security primitives if you lash together things uh, in an appropriate way. Justin Troutman and Vincent Ryman have a paper, Green Cryptography, Cleaner Engineering Through Recycling. It was published in two parts by the IEEE Security and Privacy in September and August last year. They discuss how to package crypto processes carefully for implementers so they don't screw up when they install it into equipment. I'm going to keep beating on implementation throughout this session today. Okay, we now standardize cryptographic primitives.